Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. I'm Katie, and I just have two. Those aren't coconuts. Those are watermelons. Mm-hmm. But I was really hoping you diddly dee for me. All right. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Diddly dee. <laughs> but let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the first half of chapter 31 and the corresponding film scenes. Continuity be damned, the movie just does whatever it wants, as per the usual. Dumbledore tries to get Fudge out of his office quicker than the man's lime green bowler hat went out of style. Harry's meddling winds up with him putting his nose where it doesn't belong, literally. Aging in the wizarding world seems to speed up and then just stop randomly. Mrs. Trunchbull takes over as the Azkaban detainee restraint designer. Igor Karkaroff would rather get stitches than eat any more of the Dementors cooking in Azkaban. Ludo Bagman admits to being a bit of a dumbass to no one's surprise or objection. And the Crouches win the Family of the Year award after a tongue flick proves Junior's guilt. During episode 103, it's flying, sir. Our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on the differences in Barty Crouch Jr.'s character from the book to the film? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. As you know, and everybody who listens by now, I really, really hate what they did to Barty Crouch Jr.'s character. They assassinated him. Goodness, they made him look so foolish, acting all crazy, hiding in the background in the court scene, licking his lips. Ah, I never even realized how much I hated lip licking until I listened to this podcast. You guys, next time somebody licks their lips around me, I'm just going to be like, will you just stop? Use some chapstick. But Jesus, we have Barty Crouch Jr. acting a fool in the movie, but in the books, he had a whole little bitch moment. He was probably all cut up with all types of emotions and maybe even just a generous bit of acting. I don't know. I think that either he really was kind of scared of the Dementors and going to Azkaban because, let's face it, he was the trust fund baby of the bunch. Beatrix, an old boy, probably hit the block a time or two. Ain't never been too shy to see the inside of a cell or, you know, stand up behind some racist shit. I'm sure they were a little bit more seasoned than he was. You know, and then mixed with all that hate he had for his daddy, it probably just all bubbled over. Or he was just putting on a motherfucking show. Who knows? But it definitely wasn't that shit they put on TV for us to watch. Goodness. They like to mess up his character so much. I don't understand. In the books, so well well written. We were literally con-fucking-fused. Once I found out that he was dead, I had no idea who the hell put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire and who was fucking with him. I was getting the clues, but it wasn't making sense because he was dead. And we didn't know until the last second. Until the last second. We figured it out halfway through the movie. Halfway, if you know how to watch a movie and pay attention. If you didn't go to the bathroom when he was licking his lips. Jesus. So I don't even have any more brain cells left to think about Mad-Eye's real nickname. It was probably just Mad Moody, because that's logical. And let's face it, the boy always been fucking crazy. Hello there, it is Carly. I'm calling as the sport badger to leave a message about the Potter pondering of whether or not I liked the differences in Barty Crouch Jr. from the movie to the book. Surprise, surprise, I obviously don't care for that. I really like David Tennant. I think he's a really great actor. He's beautiful. But I don't feel like the changes that they made were necessary. Surprise, like most things that they do. I wish that they had kept, like, the actual trial in there. And all of that, all his entire storyline would have been great to have in there instead of him just being, like, this rando dude who was related to a ministry member. You know, it would be better. 
Also, what do I think they called Mad Eye before they called him Mad Eye? Well, it depends. Did he lose his eye last? Was that the last thing he lost? Did he lose that chunk of nose before? Because I would have called him No Nose. No Nose Moody. That would have worked really well. Or maybe they just called him Allie. Alistair. Allie. Yeah. Sounds good. Anyways, I hope I like more things in the next one. Hey guys, how we doing? Jackson here. So, the portrayal of Barty Crouch Jr. in the film, for the way that Newell did it, very well done. Yeah, I, I liked it for the way that Newell obviously wanted it. But I still much, much prefer the Barty Crouch Jr. in the books. And especially the fact that the books leave you wondering whether he really was innocent until later, you know? When you meet him in the pensive, you don't know. You actually wonder whether he was innocent and whether his father just wanted to show he hated him, like Sirius said. And as for Mad-Eye, this is probably going to go against the grain, but I don't think they had a nickname for him at that point. I think they just called him the nutcase or the nutter but I mean like I don't think he started to really get any nicknames or reputation until after until before he retired and he got so jinx happy you know <laughs> I don't know they they might have called him a few names but I don't think they really called him anything before Mad Eye that's just my thoughts cheers Thank you so much for calling in your responses. Yeah, and don't forget that you can also respond on our Facebook page post too. We love reading and hearing your thoughts. Our trivia question last week was, how does Dumbledore respond when Harry tells him he fell asleep in divination? Harry thinks Dumbledore is going to reprimand him, but instead he just says, quite understandable, and asks Harry to continue. Congratulations goes to... Jackson Miller. Woohoo! This is his eighth week in a row. If he wins this week, he has tied the record. If he can do it one more time, he could beat it. Do you think he will? We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into the second half of Chapter 30, the pensive and the sort of corresponding film scenes. Chapter 30, the pensive, Part 2. Dumbledore says come and puts his hand under Harry's elbow. Harry feels himself rising through the air as the dungeon dissolves and everything temporarily fades to black. After feeling like he does a slow motion somersault, he lands on his feet in the dazzling light of Dumbledore's sunlit office. He gasps an apology to the headmaster that he knows he shouldn't have and stutters through explaining that the cabinet door was open. Dumbledore calmly explains that he understands and carries the basin over to his desk. He motions for Harry to sit in the seat opposite him, and Harry does so, asking what the basin is. Dumbledore explains that it's called a pensive, assuming that Harry understands the feeling of having too many thoughts and memories crammed into his mind. Harry isn't actually sure what the headmaster means, but listens as the old wizard explains that when he does feel like that, he uses the pensive because it allows him to siphon his thoughts into it and examine them at his own leisure, making it easier to spot patterns and links. Harry realizes that the white substance in the basin are thoughts, and Dumbledore offers to show him, drawing out his wand and pointing it at the edge of his silvery hair near his temple. As he pulls the wand away, a silvery white strand of what seems to be hair is clinging to it, but Harry sees that it's a new strand of the same substance in the bowl. Dumbledore adds this thought to the basin, and Harry watches as his own face floats around the surface. When Dumbledore swirls the bowl, Harry's face smoothly shifts to Snape's face, and his mouth opens and in an echoey voice says, It's coming back. Karkaroff's too. Stronger and clearer than ever. Dumbledore then sighs and says he could have made that connection without assistance, but then peers at Harry and tells him that he had been using the pensive when Mr. Fudge arrived, 
and he put it away rather hastily and must not have closed the cabinet door properly, so naturally it must have attracted Harry's attention. Harry mumbles another apology and Dumbledore shakes his head, telling him that curiosity is not a sin, but they should exercise caution. He continues prodding his thoughts in the basin, and the figure of a plump, scowling girl of about 16 rises out of it. Her voice also echoes as she tells Professor Dumbledore that he put a hex on her because she was teasing him about kissing Florence behind the greenhouses. Dumbledore watches this memory sadly and says, But why, Bertha? Why did you have to follow him in the first place? Harry repeats Bertha's name in a whisper and asks Dumbledore if that was Bertha Jorkins. Dumbledore says that is how he remembers her at school, and in this moment it strikes Harry just how old the headmaster is looking. Dumbledore quietly changes the subject, reminding Harry that he had something to tell him before he got lost in his thoughts, and Harry explains that he fell asleep in divination. He hesitates, wondering if he will be reprimanded, but Dumbledore just finds it to be understandable and tells him to continue. Harry tells him about his dream of Voldemort getting a letter from an owl and informing Wormtail that his blunder had been repaired. Someone was dead, and Wormtail wouldn't be fed to the snake but Harry would instead. Voldemort then did the Cruciatus curse on Wormtail, and Harry woke up with his scar hurting. Dumbledore looks at him and asks if his scar has hurt any other time this year, aside from the time it woke him in the summer. Harry starts to say no, then wonders how Dumbledore knew it had woken him up in the summer. Explaining that Harry is not Sirius's only correspondent, Dumbledore also mentions that he's the one who recommended the mountainside cave for him to stay in. He then gets up and starts pacing, occasionally adding more silver thoughts to the pensive, until Harry asks him if he knows why his scar is hurting him. Dumbledore theorizes that it hurts when Voldemort is both near him or feeling a particularly strong surge of hatred. When Harry asks why, he explains that Harry's scar is not an ordinary one and connects them by the curse that failed. Harry wonders if the dream really happened then, and Dumbledore responds that it's possible, even probable. He asks if Harry actually saw Voldemort, and Harry says that he didn't, commenting on how he didn't have a body, but then wondering how he could have held the wand. Dumbledore is curious about this as well, and stares across the room, again every now and then placing a new thought into the pensive. Harry wants to know if Voldemort is getting stronger, and looking older and wearier than ever, Dumbledore tells him that the years of Voldemort's first ascent to power were marked with disappearances, similar to the disappearances of Bertha Jorkins, Mr. Crouch, and a third disappearance that the Ministry is choosing to ignore of a muggle named Frank Bryce. Harry then asks about the court thing in the pensive, wanting to know if they were talking about Neville's parents. Dumbledore sharply asks if Neville never told him why he's been brought up by his grandmother, and Harry shakes his head, wondering how he could have failed to ask Neville this. Dumbledore explains that they were talking about Neville's parents, and Harry assumes they are dead, but then learns that they are insane. They reside in St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries, and they do not recognize Neville when he visits them over the holidays with his grandmother. Harry is horror-struck to realize this, especially that he had never bothered to find out. Dumbledore continues talking, letting Harry know that the Longbottoms were extremely popular, and their attacks came after Voldemort's downfall, when everyone thought they were safe. It made them all so furious that the Ministry was under great pressure to capture those responsible, and the Longbottoms' evidence was not that reliable given their condition. Harry questions whether Mr. Crouch's son was actually involved, and Dumbledore says that he has no idea. Harry then asks about Mr. Bagman, who hasn't been accused of any dark activity since, and then hesitates as he wants to ask about Snape. The potions teacher's face swirls in the pensive, and Dumbledore glances at it before looking up at Harry and informing him that Professor Snape has not either. Harry wants to know what made Dumbledore think that Snape really stopped supporting Voldemort, and the headmaster pauses before telling him that it's a matter between him and Snape. Harry recognizes the finality in Dumbledore's tone and stands to leave. As he reaches the door, Dumbledore calls to him and asks him not to mention Neville's parents to anyone else, since Neville has the right to let people know when he's ready. 
Harry agrees and turns to leave, but is stopped once more as Dumbledore wishes him good luck on the third task. The movie section starts out with Harry being expelled from the bowl of light in Dumbledore's cabinet. He finds himself back in the office with the headmaster standing next to the large bowl, telling Harry that curiosity is not a sin, but he should exercise caution. He explains that the ornate bowl is a pensive, which is very useful if you find your mind a wee bit stretched, since it allows him to again see things that he's already seen. He tells Harry that he has been searching for some small detail that he may have overlooked that would explain all the terrible things that have been happening, but every time he gets close to an answer, it slips away, which is maddening. Harry asks Dumbledore what happened to Mr. Crouch's son, and Dumbledore tells him that he was sent to Azkaban and it destroyed Barty to do it, but he had no choice because the evidence was overwhelming. He wonders why Harry asks, and Harry informs him of the dream he had about him back in the summer. Dumbledore narrows his eyes as Harry details the dream and the camera view switches to the dream scene as he describes the house and Wormtail's presence, in addition to Mr. Crouch's son. Dumbledore wonders if there have been other dreams like it, and Harry says that there has, but it's always the same. Harry asks the headmaster if the dreams are actually happening, and though Dumbledore looks alarmed by the news of them, he advises Harry not to linger over them. He leans over the pensive and tells him that it's best if he just casts them away. He pulls a silvery blue strand of light from his head and adds it to the pensive. The camera cuts to Harry walking down a corridor deep in thought, but then distracted by an argument about something being a sign. A door opens and Harry turns to find Snape and Karkaroff in the potions store. Karkaroff has his sleeve pushed up showing a tattoo of the dark mark. He looks at Harry and lowers his sleeve before walking off without another word. Harry watches Karkaroff stride away and begins to follow him, but Snape billows out into the corridor and asks him what his hurry is. Harry turns towards the potions master and reluctantly walks over to him. Snape congratulates Harry on his inspiring performance in the Black Lake, confirming that he used gillyweed and calling it ingenious. He turns and walks back into the potions cupboard, calling it a rare herb, as he climbs a ladder and searches for something among some bottles on a shelf. He explains to Harry that it isn't something found in your everyday garden, and withdraws a small green bottle, declaring that it isn't either. He descends the ladder and holds the little bottle up for Harry to see, asking him if he knows what it is. Harry suggests that it is bubble juice, and Snape corrects him, informing him that it is Veritas Serum, and three drops of it would cause even you-know-who to spill his darkest secrets. According to Snape, it is regrettably forbidden to use on a student, but he still warns Harry that if he ever steals from his personal stores again, his hand might just slip over his morning pumpkin juice. He mimes pouring the potion as Harry insists that he hasn't stolen anything from him. Snape tells him not to lie. Gillyweed may be innocuous, but boomslang skin and lacewing flies mean that he and his little friends are brewing polyjuice potion. Snape announces that he is going to find out why, and then closes the door in Harry's face. So, again, we have some similarities, but overall, there's more differences in this section. Yeah. It also adds in a movie scene that ties back to an earlier part of the book. Mm -hmm. In the book, Dumbledore actually shows up in the pensive with Harry. Mm -hmm. And grabs him by the elbow, was like, let's go, and just <laughs> hauls him on out of there. But I feel like the description of it fading to black and Harry somersaulting out of it is pretty spot on to what the movie did. It seemed pretty close, yeah, really. Because there's nothing to say that Dumbledore didn't grab him by the elbow and pull him back out. True. Because he did just randomly like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It says that when he lands on his feet in Dumbledore's office, it's like brilliantly sunlit. So clearly it's midday. Mm -hmm. It was during his divination class that he went, not at night, the no. way the movie has it. Stupid movie. Right? <laughs> Changes. No. no all. <laughs> so Harry, he, he like apologizes. He's just like, sorry, professor, I was meddling. You totally caught me. <laughs> <laughs> so really, he's just sorry he got caught. Let's be honest. It's probably a little bit of both. Maybe. He's a good kid. Yeah. He's more sorry he got caught. Probably. <laughs> Dumbledore is actually pretty cool with it. He's just like, yeah, I get it. And he picks up the basin 
takes it over to his desk and just like sits it down in the middle and invites Harry to sit down with him. He's just ready to teach Harry more about this thing. Yeah. Whereas in the movie, it's like a giant stone pedestal that I would be a little bit worried about Michael Gammon if I saw him lifting it. Right. <laughs> no, it's just like a little bowl type yeah. thing in the book. So Harry wants to know what it is. And Dumbledore explains that it's called a pensive. And he explains to Harry that it's wonderful for when your brain is just so full of thoughts you can't think. And I'm sure you know what that's like. And Harry's just like, dude, I'm 14. No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, when I was 14, I did. I could understand that very well. I actually could too, but he is a boy. Tr yeah. No offense, boys. That is true. 14-year-old boy. He's not using his brain. Not the one in his head. No. He doesn't quite get what Dumbledore means, but he listens as Dumbledore tells him that when he is feeling overrun with thoughts, he just siphons them off and puts them into this pensive, and it allows him to sort of filter through them. It's like having a computer. Yeah. I think it would be incredibly helpful in my daily life. Probably. I, I really wish I had one. I feel like detectives need one. Yes. Because he specifically says it makes it easier to spot patterns and links. Mm -hmm. This is what makes Harry realize that, that the substance, like the swirling silver stuff that he was like, I don't want to touch that with my hand, but I'm going to accidentally touch it with my nose. Brain jizz. Yeah, brain jizz. Yeah. It's actually Dumbledore's thoughts. That's just creepy. It is, especially since he shows him how he does it and he takes his wand and points it straight to his temple and literally just pulls that silvery strand. And then he adds it to the bowl and it's a thought about Harry. So Harry's face starts swirling around mm -hmm. in the bowl. It is really cool, but it's a little creepy. A little bit, yeah. So basically, Harry was swimming around in Dumbledore's brain jizz. Well, now you made it creepier. Yeah, it's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. Have we met? <laughs> Let's just keep rolling. Dumbledore swirls the bowl, and Harry's face shifts into Snape's face. Mm -hmm. And then Snape starts speaking, and he's got this kind of weird echoey voice that tells him it's coming back, Karkaroff's too, stronger and clearer than ever. And Dumbledore's just like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks at Harry and says, I was using this pensive when Fudge showed up for our meeting, and I put it away too quickly. Must not have fastened the cabinet properly, and naturally it attracted your attention, which to me just really sounds like I left this open so you'd find it. Yeah. I was just going to say that. It's a great segue for me to tell you about all this stuff. Right? And the lesson for the day, child, is that this is a pensive. Or if you're in the movie, it's a pensive. I say pensive because it's the combination of the word pensive, spelled P-E-N-S-I-V-E, -E, and a sieve, which is spelled S-I-E-V-E. -E. So I think it's still supposed to be pronounced pensive and just kind of punny in its spelling. Like I said, the movie says pensive. It's wrong. <laughs> Usually is. Because as we'll find out later, Snape says pensive. True. He's very French about it. So that's fun. I'm going to stick with pensive. Sounds good to me. Let's do that. Harry again apologizes, and Dumbledore's just like, curiosity is not a sin, but one must exercise caution with curiosity, which just makes me want to be like, dude, curiosity killed the cat. It really does. That cat's dead as fuck if it's Harry. I mean, people are trying. Yep. But hey, this is where the movie comes in. Except without all those details. Yeah. Because why would we need details? We see the shiny bowl of light vomiting Harry back into Dumbledore's office. Possibly because he pulled him out. Possibly not. Possibly. Who knows? Everything is like it was before the meddling started, except now the headmaster himself was standing next to the large bowl. He tells Harry that curiosity isn't a sin, but it did kill the cat, so maybe try not to become a dead pussy if you can help it. I'm not sure he can help it. I mean... He's done good so far, but... He is still alive. <laughs> Barely. But he's got years of meddling ahead of him. Yeah. If he's lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is also when he tells Harry that the shiny bowl is a pensive. Or again, in the movie... Pensive. Pensive. Explaining, while looking off in the distance, that it is very useful if your mind is stretched, or if you've had a little too much gillyweed. Like you do. Mm-hmm. Like Dumbledore does. Right. <laughs> so 
since it lets him relive memories that have already happened. He then goes off on a bit of a tangent about overlooking some small detail that would explain all the bullshit going on, but every time he thinks he's got it, his dank-ass gillyweed kicks in and it slips away. Dumbledore sits on the floor of his office like a sullen teenager who's just been turned down for prom, and everybody's sad. So sad. Mm Mm-hmm. So some similar information. Yeah. He makes the curiosity comment. He tells him what the pensive is. Mm -hmm. It's even used for the same thing from book to movie. So that's something. What? But he then goes really vague and doesn't give him any more information. Yeah. And in the book, he actually shows Harry how it works. Yeah. Shows him how to use it. Shows him. Tells him all about it. Brings him into some of his memories because he goes in and he prods it. And this plump figure, it looks like a girl of about 16, she's scowling. And in the same echoey voice that Snape had, she says that somebody put a hex on her because she was teasing him about kissing Florence behind the greenhouses. And Dumbledore is looking at this memory with a very sad expression on his face and just says, but why, Bertha? Why did you have to follow him in the first place? Because she's a meddler like Harry. (laughs) It's a condition. Must be. Harry hears Bertha's name and it's just like, dude, is that Bertha Jorkins? Mm-hmm. And Dumbledore explains that it's how he remembers her at school. And he still has that really, like, sad look on his face. And it kind of makes me wonder if that why, Bertha, why did you have to follow him in the first place meant something different other than following the boy who was kissing a girl behind the greenhouses. Yeah. It seems like there's definitely something else going on in Dumbledore's head. I would have to say that it seems like he has made the connection that the meddling that Bertha does is what's caused her disappearance now. Yeah. And also in this moment, Harry realizes just how old his headmaster is actually starting to look. He's aging. Yeah. And he is old. Yeah. But he's really looking it. Mm Mm-hmm. Stressful times, man. Yeah. This also isn't included in the movie, though. Instead, in an attempt to bring some lighthearted cheer into the conversation, Harry asks Dumbledore what happened to Barty Crouch Jr. And he says, that bitch got sent to the ban. So cheerful. So cheerful. Mm Mm-hmm. His pops was upset, but not much could be done because he had that evil tongue flick thing going on, which must really be an evil trait since he hasn't seen anyone do that ever since. Nope. No one at all. Nope, no one. Not one person. Or maybe somebody. Hmm, I wonder who. What's really interesting here in the movie is that Dumbledore also specifically says that the evidence was overwhelming. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more later. Yeah. For some reason, he wonders why Harry asks. And Harry's all like, well, I just came out of your memory about him, and I'm a bit of a meddler, if you hadn't noticed. Oh, and also there was this dream I had about him back in the summer, but that's probably nothing, right? Probably nothing. No. Nah. Can't be. Dumbledore's brow furrows even more, and we see Harry's dream yet again. Just in case we didn't get a really good look at Barty Crouch Jr. the other four times we've seen this. Just in case. This kind of brings it back on par with the book. Mm Mm-hmm. Because... Dumbledore changes the subject and it's like, you had to talk to me about something before you got lost in my thoughts. (laughs) And Harry's just like, yeah, okay. So I fell asleep in divination and he stops. He's like, am I about to get in trouble for confessing that? And Dumbledore's just like, quite understandable. Please continue. Which was our trivia question. Yeah. (laughs) So Harry says he had a dream about Voldemort getting a letter And telling Wormtail that his blunder has been repaired and someone's dead. So Wormtail's not going to be fed to the snake. They're going to feed Harry to the snake instead. He's like, never mind. They're still Harry. And Harry's just like, I don't want to be snake food. I mean, who does? Right. (laughs) And Voldemort then did the Cruciatus Curse on Wormtail, which woke Harry up with pain in his scar. And now he's here. Ipso facto. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's not what happened in the movie? No. But it does talk about that dream that's not the same dream that was in the movie, but it still kind of sort of corresponds-ish, ish-ish. Ishy-ish. I'm trying. Yeah. 
Dumbledore wants to know if his scar has hurt any other time this year, aside from the time it woke him up in the summer. And Harry's just like, well, no, but hey, how'd you know it woke me up this summer? <laughs> Dumbledore's just like, because you told Sirius and Sirius told me. He actually is the one who recommended that Sirius use that mountainside cave for a safe place to stay. So they've been corresponding all year as well. Well, that was nice of him. Mm hmm. But that changes it a little bit from how the movie had it because Harry only had that dream and the scar pain one other time. And movie Harry is constantly cringing and grabbing his scar. Yeah. It's almost a tick at this point, I feel like. But aside from all the stuff about Sirius and the fact that Harry only had the scar pain one other time, we have another similarity since Dumbledore asks if there have been other dreams like it. Harry responds with a resounding, hell yeah, a bunch of them. But seriously, they're no big deal, right? Dumbledore? Right? right? And Dumbledore's just like, of course not. I bet they don't mean anything at all. Maybe don't eat too much dairy before bed next time. <laughs> he then leans over the pensive and pulls a strand of brain jizz out of his temple with his wand and tells Harry that he'd be better off to just cast his thoughts away. Because that's super easy for Harry to do. Sure, anybody. Yeah. It's also not how it happened in the book. Never is. <laughs> because like we said before, he just kind of like shoves it under the table. Mm -hmm. He's like, nope, don't worry about it. Do this instead. And in the book, he just full on goes into explanations. And he actually has a full conversation with Harry and gives him information. Because at this point in the book, after Harry has mentioned the dream and the pain in his scar... Dumbledore gets up and he's just walking back and forth in his office, occasionally pulling more brain jizz out and putting it in the pensive. And finally, Harry's just like, so do you know why my scar's hurting me? <laughs> and the movie didn't even touch that. No, not at all. Dumbledore has a theory that it hurts both if Voldemort is near him or feeling a particularly strong surge of hatred. Like what, like if Teletubbies is on or? I mean, that might do it. You never know. Yeah. Probably something more like one of his inept followers screws things up and nearly ruins his entire plans. But Teletubbies suck too. Yeah, I think both are pretty probable. <laughs> when Harry asks why that's happening, Dumbledore explains that Harry's scar is not an ordinary one. And it actually connects them by the curse that failed because it was a curse meant to kill Harry, but instead it depowered Voldemort. So Harry wonders because of this connection if the dream actually happened. And Dumbledore's just like, yeah, probably. Yeah. And he wants to know if Harry actually saw Voldemort. And Harry's just like, well, no, I mean, he doesn't even have a body. But then how was he holding that wand? Magic. Well, yeah, <laughs> but actually Dumbledore is just like, how indeed? So it's pretty good evidence that Voldemort is getting stronger. And that's Harry's next question mm -hmm. and looking older and wearier than he was even a few minutes before when Harry was just like, dude, you're looking old. Dumbledore is just like, I mean, when he first ascended to power, there were years marked with disappearances and the disappearances of Bertha Jorkins, Mr. Crouch, right here on Hogwarts grounds, and a third disappearance that the Ministry is choosing to ignore because it's a muggle and they don't think that matters. Mm -hmm. But I do because I'm Dumbledore, bitches. But there's a muggle named Frank Bryce that went missing. And because we read the book, we already know who that is and that it is, in fact, something significant to Voldemort's re-rise in power. Yes. Harry then asks about the court thing in the pensive, but it's not about Crouch. In the movie, he asked about Crouch, specifically Crouch's son. Mm -hmm. That's because that's the only court thing he saw in the pensive in the movie. So. But they did mention Neville's parents. They did mention the Longbottoms. Very true. And that was Harry's concern this time. He mm -hmm. wanted to know if they were talking about Neville's parents. Which they were. Yeah. Obviously. And Dumbledore is surprised to learn that Neville's never mentioned why he's being raised by his grandmother. And Harry's just like, how the fuck have I never asked him that in all these years? I freaking share a room with him. Sometimes you just don't want to ask things, though. Yeah. I just don't even think it ever occurred to him to ask. Yeah. You know what? Maybe it's because he's so used to people asking about him and his scar and his parents 
He doesn't want to inflict that on someone else. Yeah, he's just like, that's my business. Fuck y'all. So he wants Neville to have that privacy. Maybe, but if that is it, it was a very subconscious thought because he has no idea why he's never asked Neville this. Very true. Dumbledore confirms that, like we said, it's Neville's parents and Harry assumes that that means they're dead, like his parents. And he's just like, dude, Neville and I have something in common (laughs) even more than you think, Harry. (laughs) (laughs) Just wait a couple more books. But Dumbledore then fills them in on the fact that they are not actually dead. They're just insane. Which is not much better. Possibly even worse. Exactly. They're living at St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. And Neville goes to visit them with his grandmother over the holidays. And they don't really seem to recognize him. That's so sad. But yeah, it's awful. Mm-hmm. And Harry is just absolutely horror-struck to learn this. And he's still just like kicking himself. Like, how have I never bothered to talk to Neville about this? Mm -hmm. But Dumbledore just keeps talking and tells Harry that the Longbottoms were extremely popular. And when they got attacked, it was after Voldemort's downfall and everybody thought that they were safe. So it was just extra outrageous. People were pissed and the ministry had a lot of pressure to try and figure out who did it. Unfortunately, because of the condition the Longbottoms were left in, their evidence wasn't that reliable. Which is understandable. Right, but it also directly goes against what they said in the movie about the evidence being overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was just played out completely differently. Yeah. Well, because, too, you had another person actually saying, I know for a fact that this person took part in the torture Of Frank and Alice Longbottom. Right. You had Karkaroff saying that in the pensive. And then the idiot accused did the most unsuspicious thing ever and tried to run. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And then he became crazy Barney Crouch. (laughs) Junior. (laughs) Yes. It left zero doubt that Barney Crouch Jr. was involved. Whereas in the book, Harry's just like, was he actually involved? Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore's just like, I honestly have no idea. So Harry moves on and asks about Mr. Bagman. Another happier topic. Right. Sure. But learns that he has not been accused of any dark activity since. So that probably was just an accident. Mm -hmm. And then Harry's just like, must meddle further, scared to ask. (laughs) And thankfully, the pensive actually kind of asks the questions for him. And it just sort of swirls over to Snape's face again. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore looks at it and then looks at Harry and he's just like, nor has Snape. (laughs) Well, he specifically says Professor Snape because he doesn't disrespect his employees by calling them by last name only in front of students. True. So Harry's like, well, how do you know he actually stopped supporting Voldemort? That's a matter between me and him, period. Yeah. So just maybe stop meddling on this one guy. And the finality in Dumbledore's tone tells Harry that, This discussion's over, so he stands to leave. And as he's about to walk out, Dumbledore calls to him and is like, don't say anything about Neville's parents to anyone. He has the right to let people know when he's ready. Mm -hmm. Because Dumbledore stand up like that. Right. And if anyone can understand that, Harry can. Oh, yeah, for sure. And he obviously agrees. Mm -hmm. Turns to leave again, but Dumbledore stops him one more time to tell him good luck on the third task. The movie actually keeps going this time. It's normally the book that does that. Right? (laughs) But this scene ties it into something that happened previously in the book. So it isn't completely a change. More of a shift. Yes. Except for the fact that it happened back in chapter 23. So it's been a minute. It has been a hot minute. So Harry makes his way down the corridor, but his need to meddle just becomes far too strong when he hears an argument going on nearby. I mean, can you blame him? No. A door opens just as he happens to be passing by. Talk about right place, right time. It's like the universe wants him to meddle. (laughs) It is. (laughs) And Harry turns to find Snape and Karkaroff in the potions closet. Totally not doing seven minutes in heaven. Well, not at that moment. Maybe when the door was closed. Maybe. Who knows what was going on before? As soon as Karkaroff started showing some sleeve. (laughs) Got a little weird for Snape. You know, Snape's a sucker for some forearm. What can we say? (laughs) Anywho. Yeah, on that forearm, he is showing off his sweet ink. 
because it's badass. I mean, it is. Yeah. And he's trying to get Snape to show his off, too. I showed you mine. You show me yours. Right? That's only fair. But this is very reminiscent of the conversation that they had in the potions classroom Mm -hmm. when Harry knocked over his armadillo bile so that he could squat down and hide behind his cauldron and listen in the whole time. Yes. He just happened to catch the tail end of it happening more in private. Yes. And it's also, it was brought up in the pensive in Dumbledore's office in the book too. True. So that might kind of be where they got that. Very possibly. I still don't like the mishmashing and rearranging of scenes, but for this, it's not so insane. I it guess. worked okay. Yeah. It definitely hasn't made me as annoyed as some of the other things that got changed and shifted around. Definitely. But Karkaroff stares Harry down as he lowers his sleeve and skulks away down the hall like a sassy model on the runway during Paris Fashion Week. Harry hates to see Karkaroff go, but loves to watch him walk away as he starts to follow after him, until Snape flounces out into the corridor and asks what his hurry is. Now this will tie it back into the scene that happened in chapter 27, Mm -hmm. when the whole article thing happened in his class, so he separated the trio and put Harry right in front of his desk. Yes. But again, totally different timing. It works but why not just keep it the same way i know it's neither here nor there harry reluctantly faces the potions master and hesitantly walks over to him i don't blame him there honestly while i was watching it it was going through my head like why did he walk over to him like maybe just stay where you are let him come to you like or just take off guy right run (laughs) what's he gonna do i mean he knows where he sleeps well that is true anyway Snape congratulates Harry on his inspiring performance in the Black Lake. Asks if Gillyweed was used, despite already damn well knowing the answer. And he calls it ingenious. Which does not sound sincere in the slightest. No. Oh no, he's being sarcastic as fuck right there. He turns and walks back into the potions cupboard, calling it a rare herb as he climbs a ladder and searches for something among some bottles on a shelf. Harry hears the words, but he can't help feeling that they're a little too sassy for his liking. But they were so sincere. (laughs) Not so much. Snape meant every word that he said. (laughs) He explains to Harry that it isn't usually found in your everyday garden. Which is honestly putting me back on the train that Neville stole it. Yeah, well, yeah, there is that. But he goes on and takes a small green bottle off a shelf, pronouncing its contents to also be quite rare. He descends the ladder and holds the little bottle up for Harry to see, condescendingly asking him if he knows what it is. How awesome would it have been if Harry could have given him the right answer? Right? Hermione could have. Oh, that would have messed with him so bad. I know, it would have been great. (laughs) Or if he would have held the bottle up and there was the label right there on it. He just goes, <laughs> Veritaserum? Mm-hmm. Read it. Yeah. yeah. That'd be funny. Damn it, movie. Come on. But Harry, having had enough of Snape's bullshit, suggests that it is bubble juice. Because that's the best he could come up with. Maybe that's what bubble juice looks like. Maybe. But Snape, equally tired of Harry's bullshit, corrects him, announcing that it is Veritaserum. It turns out that three measly drops of this stuff would turn anyone into a snitch, including Voldemort himself. I want to point out that the movie has Snape say, you know who at this point? Yes. And I thought that was so weird because in the book, he actually constantly refers to him as the Dark Lord to the point that Harry's just like, how come you actually say the Dark Lord? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that's later on, but... But still, yeah. I was like, Snape would not say you know who. Bad movie. Bad. (laughs) I have to agree with you there. Because even if he didn't say the Dark Lord, he would at least say Voldemort. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Come on. Ugh. Anyway. He goes on to say that unfortunately he's not allowed to use it on students, but reminds Harry that he has never been above poisoning his pupil's unprotected pumpkin juice, especially the ones that piss him off by pilfering his potions. Because he's petty like that. I mean, Professor's pretty petty. Harry emphatically denies stealing anything. 
Snape tells him not to lie to him. Don't lie to me. <laughs> but before a punch can be thrown, Snape adds that Gillyweed may not be a big deal. Which puts me right back on the fact that I think it was stolen. Mm-hmm. I, I'm coming with you on this. Trust me. I want to re-ask that pondering now that we're going to draw attention to this. Mm-hmm. I want to know if y'all still think now that we're in this Neville spot. didn't steal this. Yeah. Because it was stolen. It sounds like it was. We're going to rethink this. Come up with new theories now. Yep. Let's hear them, guys. But yeah, Gillyweed may not be a big deal, but other missing ingredients imply that Polyjuice Potion is being brewed, most likely by him and his little friends. And one way or another, Snape is going to find out why. And he punctuates his sentence by just slamming the door in Harry's face. That is quite the period. I have had doors slammed in my face before, and it's scary. Maybe more of an exclamation point than a period. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. For sure. In bold font. Mm Mm-hmm. And like we said before, this reference is still that conversation from chapter 27. Yeah. When he specifically shows him the Veritaserum Mm -hmm. and is like, gillyweed... Lace wing flies. Boom slang skin. Boom slang skin. And Harry's just like, Okay, you got well, that me on the Dobby. one. Yeah. And then the other two were Hermione. Although we know that he's not making reference to what went stolen back in second year. He thinks they've been stolen now, but they don't give you that impression in the movie. Well... They have, Other than he's bringing it up, but there was no reference to Snape's office being broken into. Other than he's bringing it up, and also Moaning Myrtle bringing it up when Harry was in the prefect's bathroom, saying that she saw some polyjuice potion in a blocked drain the other day. So there is that. It kind of works. I don't think it worked as well. No. As having the whole scene where Snape is specifically freaking out because somebody broke into his office and the way that it worked out, it looked like it could have been Harry. Yeah. I agree with you there. But also, I have to say, at least it's better than the tongue flick as far as hints and clues go. It's definitely more subtle. (laughs) Yes. So at least there's that. Yeah. So we do have a deleted scene for this section. It basically happens the next day after this little exchange between Snape and Harry. And it's the trio just talking about what went down. And I can see why they'd cut that if it's just basically a recap. Well, not only that, but it actually literally repeated everything. It was the three of them talking about it. And then Hermione kind of going off and going, well, he thinks someone's brewing polyjuice potion, doesn't he? But he literally already said that in the scene. So there was really no point in keeping it. Yeah, I get why it was taken out. Yeah. Had the end of that scene not been in there for whatever reason, yeah, you would have needed Hermione to connect the dots on that. But yeah, but I'm fine with them doing it the way they did it. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to stick to how it happened in the book, then better to give us the information in a more direct way than an indirect way and definitely don't spoon feed us the exact same thing we just saw or just read. Exactly. I have to agree. But that'll bring us to the end of the movie scene and there are no new actors to talk about. So we'll go right into this week's Potter Ponderings. Which as we've mentioned, now that we've gotten to this part of the movie where Snape is specifically talking about the things Harry stole or Harry allegedly stole out of his (laughs) private stores Do you still think Neville didn't steal the gillyweed? Hmm. Hmm. Intrigue. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. We really look forward to reading and hearing them. And this will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from... Mary Rhymes Marchbank. She writes, I am a Slytherin, my Patronus is a mink, and I can't remember exactly what my wand is. My sister had the first movie recorded, and I watched it while holding my baby nephew when I was seven. Then in fourth grade, my teacher loved Harry Potter, and we read the second book as a class, and that's when I got into the books. My teacher was great. She had a lot of Harry Potter figurines around the classroom, too. Thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story with us, Mary. I love hearing of teachers who got their students into Harry Potter. Yes. It's my favorite way, too, aside from parents. Yeah. (laughs) 
And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can just message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, how many points are Harry and Cedric tied in first place with going into the third and final task? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word, hashtag yay Hogwarts, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 31, the third task, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.